Voices ranging from writer Jonathan Chait to comedian Patton Oswalt are saying they, as liberals, have a problem with the state of political correctness, a problem with what they and others see recent efforts by so-called social justice warriors to change the way we think about race and gender. On one hand, it could be the logical extension of left-wing ideals of justice and fairness. On the other, it could be an attempt to police speech. Joining us now for more on this potential left-wing divide, in New Haven, Connecticut via Skype, Omar Aziz, law student at Yale University and fellow at the Information Society Project. In our nation's capital, Akash Maharaj, CEO of the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption. And with us in studio, Paulette Sr., CEO of YWCA Canada, and Steph Guthrie, Gender and Culture Analyst and Executive Director of Women in Toronto Politics. And it's great to have you two in our studio and you two out of towners back on our program again. I'm going to start by reading something uh, that Jonathan Chait wrote in New York Magazine just a couple of months ago, and here we go. Political correctness appeals to liberals because it claims to represent a more authentic and strident opposition to their shared enemy of race and gender bias. And of course, liberals are correct not only to oppose racism and sexism, but to grasp, in a way conservatives generally do not, that these biases cast a nefarious and continuing shadow over nearly every facet of American life. Liberals believe, or ought to believe, that social progress can continue while we maintain our traditional ideal of a free political marketplace where we can reason together as individuals. Political correctness challenges that bedrock liberal ideal. While politically less threatening than conservatism, the far right still commands far more power in American life, the PC left is actually more philosophically threatening. It is an undemocratic creed. Okay, let's pick that apart. Akash Maharaj, let's start with you in Ottawa. What do you think of what he's had to say? I tend to agree. I think that those of us who identify as progressives, who believe that, um, that believe in equal dignity of all people, in equal rights, and in equal voice, have the greatest respons responsibility to champion freedom of speech and freedom of expression. But the test of our, of our ideals, of our convictions, isn't our willingness to talk to one another and to espouse our own ideals. It's our willingness to extend those rights to people who are least worthy of them. In other words, we cannot stand up for liberalism if we are not also prepared to stand up for others expressing the contrary view. Let's go around on this. Paulette, what do you say? I think, I think a little differently than that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it is, um, I, I think that people who want change in society actually probably want it now <laughs> and not over an incremental period of time. And I think those of us who think it's okay to have it be incremental over a period of time are probably in places where we don't have to worry, we're not threatened, our lives are not at risk, um, our way of life is not something that we worry about every day. And so I think it is uh, part of a, a privileged, I guess, way of thinking that, uh, that folks want to um, have progress over time as opposed to wanting to just possibly get rid of those systems that continue to oppress their lives. Do you think that what you've just said is necessarily at odds with what Akash just said? I, I think there's a difference um, because it doesn't mean you can't have dialogue, but it is a much more realistic dialogue and it is less, possibly less theoretical and more real. Omar Aziz, where are you on this? I think that Chait, in, in one sense, what he's saying is too narrow, and in one sense, it's too broad. So yes, PC culture is threatening, but the right-wingers, the, the supporters of the establishment, the supporters of power centers, the racists, the homophobes, the misogynists, the sexists, the Islam, the anti-Semites, these are very threatening ideas as well. But the response that liberals should give to them is not to silence them or to shut them up, and to turn them into martyrs and give them 10 times as many readers and viewers as they would have otherwise, but to challenge them and rebut them and to rebuke them. The, my right to free speech means that I'm, I also have the right to listen and to hear viewpoints that I might find offensive, that I might find irreverent, that I might find blasphemous. That's what it means to live in a free society. And um, to the previous speaker's point, I don't think that that is at odds with social progress and fighting for social justice. If you look at probably the most successful civil rights movement in history, at least in, in modern times, the gay rights movement, in 1993, you have the president of the United States, a liberal, 
basically ban and gays in the military. And just 20 years later, you have the Supreme Court about to rule on the right to, uh, gay, of gays and lesbians to marry. How did they do that? They did that by persuading people they disagreed with through arguments and through logic that they had a civil right to marry. And we need to apply that standard in all of our battles, whether it's African Americans in the United States, whether it's those of us who are very supportive of Palestinian rights in the Middle East. The way we do that is through convincing and persuading people with whom we disagree, not silencing them. Anyone. Okay, Steph Guthrie. Well, I think a lot of the time when we say that someone is being shut down for their views, a lot of the time what's actually happening is dialogue. People are just speaking back to what they see as that person's harmful ideas, right? So, uh, and when you talk about something like gay marriage, well, sure, there's been a lot of persuasive dialogue, but there's also been boycotting the businesses of people who are known to oppose things like gay marriage. It's important for us to, uh, to show where we stand in one way or another, because that's all part of this macro level conversation we're having about what's okay and what isn't. Steph, I mentioned in the intro this expression that gets a lot of, uh, it gets out there these days, you know, social justice warriors. A lot of people don't like that term. Is there a better term we should be using to describe people who bring their opinions to bear on this issue? You know, I think it's better not to label people because the reality is that a lot of people who are painted with this brush of social justice warrior, we actually have quite different views in a lot of cases. Uh, and personally, I just want to say, you know, if someone called me a social justice warrior and I didn't have all this pejorative context, I would actually take it as a compliment. It sounds like a pretty cool thing to be. I don't, uh, I don't really see why you wouldn't want to be a warrior for social justice. Uh, I also don't see why you wouldn't want to be as uh, correct as possible in terms of your politics. So I think that there are these pejorative uh, you know, connotations that we've given to these terms that in actuality are, are really not so bad things to be. Well, that's the thing, Paul. It has taken on a connotation of being not great, right? There, mm -hmm. I mean, you can get Twitter bombed by social justice warriors and, it, and it's a whole different thing. Do you have an objection to use of that term? And if so, is there something you'd rather be called? Yeah, I, I agree with Seth. I think, um, I think it is important to um, actually fundamentally uh, identify what it is that we're talking about. And fundamentally to me, it's about human rights. You know, and, and human rights um, are critical to the daily lives of people, for example, that we work with every day. Um, so whether it's about poverty, whether it's about racism, whether it's about sexism, and, and sometimes all those three working together at the same time, um, the dialogue that we're having is important, but it's also important for people who probably haven't had a voice in a long, long time through social media. They're now able to actually say, actually, I don't agree with your liberal view because it's not helping me in my day-to-day -day life. And so for the first time, those who've been um, having the power and the say and have been getting the attention are being challenged. And I think that's brought uh, this issue to bear and, and is now being labeled uh, political correctness as opposed to, oh, well now we can actually have a dialogue that matters as opposed to one that is only about titillating conversations. Akash, I'm not asking you to speak on behalf of all left-wing people or causes, but <laughs> I wonder if you could weigh in on the issue of how much of a divide do you think there is among people on the left as it relates to political correctness? I think that there is a healthy debate, which is of course healthy. But I think that what has changed in recent years has been that a tone of insecurity that has crept in on the left. That is, there can often be a tension between our ideals as liberals on the one hand and our ideals as Democrats on the other, especially at a time when liberals aren't, aren't universally winning the, um, winning the debate in every country of the world. There has been the rise of fundamentalism, in the Middle East and parts of North Africa, the rise of xenophobia in Europe, the rise of kleptocracies in, in Asia. But I think that it is, this reinforces our responsibility as liberals to combat censorship and to combat the shutting down of dialogue. All of the rights that we fight for as liberals, be it social justice, be it the um, reduction of poverty, be it the emancipation of oppressed people, all of those are impossible unless they are built upon a foundation of free public discourse and freedom of, of expression. And freedom of expression is fundamentally meaningless unless it includes the freedom to offend, the freedom to outrage, and the freedom to be wrong. I think that, that it is a mistake to conclude that freedom of expression is in some way the enemy 
of radical progress. Indeed, free expression is the only thing that ever has, drawn, has driven radical progress. For people who want change now, we don't ha just have to silence our enemies, we have to meet them and defeat them. You are in the Canadian capital right now, but I know because I've known you for a long time, you do keep an eye on things uh, in the American capital as well. Do you think there is more of a debate amongst the American left or the Canadian left? That's an interesting question. I think that the, the American, American politics in general are far more polarized, and as a result, there tends to be a far more strident debate, um, both within people who self-identify as the left and between the left and the right. Um, I think that Canada, our public dialogue has often suffered from an excess of courtesy <laughs> and uh, a deficit of, of um, a deficit to confront difficult, difficult issues that can often divide us. But I think that with the coming election, um, that is likely to change because whereas in previous elections, uh, previous Canadian elections have been dominated by political parties trying to seize the middle ground, there really has been a shift towards parties in this election trying to play to their base. Whether that will have an impact on the population at large I remain, remains to be seen. But I think that it is at, at least a positive thing that Canadians will have a real and an honest choice. Omar, let me ask you the same question because you're down in the States right now, but you're from up here. Where do you yeah. see a more dynamic debate happening, among the Canadian left or the American left? I definitely think it's in the, um, it's in the American left. Um, also, the, the history and the co political culture in the two countries are, are very different, and we should keep that in mind. I think that um, a variant of PC, PC-ness infuses and suffuses the, the Canadian political um, spectrum, both on the left and the right. Um, and oftentimes you see this in the academy, where people are very reluctant to tell you exactly what they think. Um, whereas over here, I find that Oftentimes we can go to the other extreme where people are just offensive for the sake of being offensive. But look, on the nature of political correctness, I would rather you or any individual man or woman, anyone I come into contact with, share their opinions um, and ideas and arguments with me unfiltered and uncensored and without the sugarcoating of PCness. And it happens all the time in, in the university and other institutions I've been in where people will say, in public, they'll say one thing, and then in private, even on the same day, they'll be like, well, I'm going to be politically incorrect for a second. Please, be politically correct, incorrect all the time. I would have a lot more <laughs> respect for you if you offend me to my face and tell me exactly what you think than try to protect me because you think that I'm going to be too offended and can't take what you have to say. I assure you, it takes a lot to get me upset, and I've probably heard worse. <laughs> <laughs> Steph, let's I, return. I, I, Sorry, Akash, go ahead. I'm just going to say I, I absolutely agree with that. Better an honest enemy than a false friend. And I think that one of the most insidious, one of the most poisonous effects of trying to silence our critics is, is that we fool ourselves into believing that they are not there. The truth is, by silencing the merchants of hate, we don't make them go away. We just, uh, we just um, reduce their visibility and, and persuade society that this isn't happening. It allows bigotry and racism to multiply under the radar screen. That's why I think it's important to extend freedom of speech to those we disagree with, because they tend to condemn themselves with every word they utter. Well, that is one side of the argument. And Steph, I, I don't know if you're on the other side of the argument, but let's spend some time discussing this anyway. Can we trust the marketplace of ideas to deal with bigotry in a satisfactory fashion? What's your view? Very good question. I mean, I certainly think that there's a role for things like policy and legislation, but absolutely, I, I think that uh, one of the best ways that we can work together to create a better world is by sharing our opinions and ideas with one another. Uh, but the most important thing in that equation is that we actually listen to each other instead of talking past each other. And uh, the thing is that um, as you know, Paulette was saying earlier, there's some people who have long had access to a platform for their views. They're generally accustomed to kind of broadcasting those views and not having to deal with very much pushback. Um, so now we are, I don't think we're, I really think that there's a bit of a straw man being created by some of the other people today. I don't think that there's a lot of, uh, I don't think that there's as much censorship happening as we're actually talking about. The reality of it is that people are criticizing other people's views. So so it's one person's free speech being met with perhaps many other people's free speech. And, uh, and that's a healthy dialogue and one we need to be having. Well, how healthy would it be if you were in the midst of a debate with somebody about an issue and they decided in the middle of that debate to call you a feminazi, for example? 
Is that okay? Well, no. In the interest I, I mean, of free speech? Personal, personal insults are, are not ideal. And the thing is that sometimes when people get into these discussions, it's, it's about a heated issue. And oftentimes when somebody, uh, for example, who you might call a social justice warrior, uh, expresses anger toward the person that they're talking to, oftentimes that person has been uh, treating them somewhat dismissively uh, and not really making much of an effort to understand where they're coming from. And oftentimes it'll be uh, a person who's oppressed trying to share their life experience with someone who doesn't share that type of oppression. And uh, so really, the person who has the privilege in that discussion should be tuning in and listening to the other person a little bit more instead of uh, dismissing them and kind of riling them up to a point where they end up expressing anger about not being heard. Paula, do you trust the marketplace of ideas to deal with issues such as bigotry? I'm going to pick up where Seth um, left off because I think um, I was saying earlier that we have had uh, traditional media that's really had um, the, the marketplace. It's been the only marketplace that it, that's existed for a very long time. And so I'm, I'm a woman, I'm a black woman, I come from two communities that have uh, experienced oppression in, in one form or another, sexism and racism and I'm sure other isms. However, you know, I've often read articles in the paper or heard interviews that I haven't agreed with, but I haven't had the outlet through which to express that. And so people who have been in, in those really? situations. Can I just stop you there? What do you uh -huh. mean you don't have the outlet to deal with I it? haven't. Well, I'm, I'm not a journalist. Um, I don't work in media. Um, you got a Twitter account. <laughs> I do have a Twitter account. You're on account. Facebook. And I need to be more active. <laughs> <laughs> you're, wait a second. You're on Twitter. Mm -hmm. You got a Facebook account? Yes. You're the CEO of a pretty significant organization in right. our community. Mm -hmm. What do you mean you don't have an outlet? Well, well there's three outlets right there. Yes, and I'm using them right now. <laughs> <laughs> Right, but I guess I'm not just talking about me, I'm talking about people like me. Okay. Right, and therefore, there are uh, many sectors of our society who um, have not had the outlet for, uh, for a very long time, and so being on social media provides them an opportunity to do that. And I think we're, we're uh, on a bit of a shifting ground right now when it comes to the voices that are coming to fore and the expressions and the um, free speech. And it's not, it's not just been free speech by those who have the means to do so. It's been free speech by people who haven't had the means. And social media has given them the, the outlet to do that. And so I think that it makes for healthier dialogue, not insults, but healthier dialogue, an opportunity to engage, hopefully an opportunity to listen by those who have had that opportunity all this time. And, and probably um, you know, engage communities that they haven't engaged but just have formed assumptions and opinions about and written about those opinions and assumptions. Let me follow up with Omer. Do you think we were talking about social media here and the power or not of social media to change minds, to be a useful tool during uh, these kinds of debates? Uh, do you think it is? I mean, look, I think it depends. Um, technology is inherently neutral. I think that you could have um, you know, a bigot with 100,000 followers and you could have a liberal um, intellectual with a million followers and you could have hordes and mobs coming after people um, who, who make a um, offhand remark as that happens. Um, and of course, some Twitter accounts should be banned, right? ISIS uh, accounts should be banned. I mean, there's no free speech justification for inciting hatred and inciting violence and targeting people. Um, but to the previous comment about free speech versus, and the individual versus the group. I think that freedom of expression is intrinsically the dissident and the minority and the powerless individual's right. When in such an unequal world where wealth is imbalanced, where there are power centers with disproportionate power, where there's um, the power and authority to uh, silence people, it's the individual minority who can use free speech um, as a dissident to, to push reform and to push ideas that the majority might not want to hear. And you see this in the developing world all the time. I mean, two Bangladeshi bloggers were hacked to death in the middle of Dhaka in the past three months because they had the temerity and the audacity to question um, the ver veracity of Islam. You had a Pakistani woman blogger um, and dissident intellectual who was murdered uh, last week for daring to, to question the Pakistani government's treatment of minorities and their human rights abuses. Everywhere in the rest of the world, people are using the right of free speech to extend egalitarianism and equality. Over here in the West, we should not consider these antithetical or oppositional. The uh, advancement of equality need not come at the expense or the abridgment or the negation of free speech. They go hand in hand.
And as soon as you separate them, we're on very treacherous territory. I just want to understand your comments, though, Omer. Pre presumably, the people you just described who came to that tragic and awful ending must have been seen by their enemies to be powerful and threatening. Otherwise, the reaction presumably would have been to ignore them. So do, well, they do have power then, don't they? No, no, they, they don't. If, if you're a woman in the, in the Middle East or in South Asia, you, you, your influence, I think influence would be a, a more appropriate word, it might extend to your 10,000 Twitter followers and the people who show up to the salon that you hold in the cafe. But do, do you think you compare to the mob with guns? Do you think she compares to the powerful intelligence agencies who try to silence her? Of course not. I mean, individuals like that are cutting against the established power systems, and they have the obligation and, and the right to do that. They're, they're cut down when they do that. The reason why the mob feels threatened by her power is because they're insecure. When an individual or a group is insecure of their ideas, they silence other people. If we are on, on the left are so sure of our views and so sure that we are on the right side of history, then let's have a debate amongst ourselves and amongst our opponents and indeed some of our enemies if we think that we're on the right. We, we should not be insecure and try to silence other people if we think that history is on our side, if we think that we are advancing the cause of justice and freedom and equality for the powerless and minorities. Uh, Kash, let me try this with you. Uh, I, I know you're against bigotry and I know you're against limiting speech. But are you confident enough in the marketplace of ideas and free speech to think that it can, at the end of the day, conquer bigotry? Absolutely, and without question. You cannot be a, a part-time Democrat and you cannot be a part-time liberal. If you believe in equality and equal dignity of all people, it's because you believe in the wisdom and the intelligence of your fellow human being. And if you are a liberal, you have an obligation to place your faith in the judgment of your fellow citizens. That is one of the reasons why I believe in freedom of expression, not just because I, I don't want anyone telling me what I may or may not say, not just because I don't think it is right to tell other people what they may or may not say, but also because I believe when everyone, good and bad, right and wrong, has the opportunity to speak his or her mind, we always get the best outcome. Uh, what, some of the work that I, I, I do uh, with the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption is specifically in the post-Arab Spring states and currently in the Ukraine. And in all those countries that have, have shaken off dictatorships, they did it because ordinary people had the ability, people previously had no voice, to rise up, to express their views, and to harness the power of words to move entire societies. And historically and actually, the kind of people who try to squelch freedom of expression are never people who believe in liberty. It's never people who believe in injustice. It's always people who have an, have an interest in silencing the majority. And I think that as liberals, our first opportunity, our first responsibility has, has to be to promote freedom of expression. I also disagree with the, uh, the sentiment that, um, that there has not been a move towards squelching freedom of expression. In the United States, between 60 to 75 percent of universities have free speech uh, have um, speech codes that restrict freedom of, ex of expression beyond legal requirements. In the United Kingdom, that percentage rises to 80 percent, and I think that is antithetical to everything a university and a free society should stand for. There are merchants of hates out there, and they often are people who are very powerful. But I want to confront those people, and if they want to attack those of us who believe in liberalism. I say bring it on. I don't want to give them power. I don't want to give them martyrdom by silencing them and by acting as if I'm afraid of their words. I want to show the world and them that they have something to fear from our words. Hmm. Steph, would you agree that there's something terribly ironic about universities being, in some respects, the last place you go for free speech nowadays because there's uh, sometimes so much at stake in um, not allowing free speech, donations from wealthy donors, etc. I think uh, it really depends on what these speech codes actually contain because it's, if it's about you know forbidding hate speech on campus, well, I am absolutely in favor of that because Do we all it agree creates, on what that is. Uh, hate speech would be uh, speaking about uh, speaking about groups in a way that kind of violates their human rights. I mean, I would I would look at the groups that are outlined by the Ontario Human Rights Code as a good starting point for that sort of thing. Um, you just you just really ticked off Ezra Levant. Huh, I'm sure he's that not, this not is not the anymore. first time. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't think he watches this program. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is true. Um, but uh, I think that uh, that 
universities also need to be safe spaces for students to learn, right? And one of the things that we forget when we talk about freedom of speech is that um, when a general tone is set by a conversation that kind of says that people with certain characteristics or certain kinds of identities, you know, uh, are being spoken about in a way that is hateful or discriminatory, they're not going to feel as comfortable participating in the conversation. So I mean, we're seeing this example uh, play out on social media with uh, the terrorism that is being inflicted on women tweeters, and in particular, women of color, trans women. Uh, and you know, they're, every time they tweet something, they're being harassed by, uh, you know, incessantly by hateful people. And so all of a sudden, some of those people start dropping offline because you know what? It's not worth it. It's not worth all the pain of being harassed to that extent. And so why aren't we uh, trying to you know, feverishly defend their freedom of speech and the fact that they're being shut out of the conversation? You've been on the receiving end of some of that, I imagine, over the years? A bit, yes. A bit. <laughs> and, and, and what should we be prepared to do with those flamethrowers or trolls or whatever you want to call them that on the one hand respects their freedom of speech, but on the other hand teaches them some manners. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it occurs to me that uh, freedom of speech is not absolute in Canada the way it is in the US, and I think that's an important point to make. Is that good or bad? Um, I think it's good. I think it's good because, um, you know, when, you're, when you are, um, you know, uh, saying hateful things about groups of people, not just an individual, or an individual because of the group that they belong to. I, th I think that's where human rights uh, trump freedom of speech. And so our, our, our Charter of Rights and Freedoms set that out very clearly, uh, or as clearly as it can be. Mm -hmm. um, probably, uh, you know, there, there's been some test cases. But, you know, um, fundamentally we do have freedom of speech in Canada. And uh, it means that the freedom of speech that we have also has to come with some responsibilities. And it's responsible is to make sure that uh, our freedom of speech is not infringing on the rights of other people. And, and I think uh, to the, the sometimes <coughs> it happens to the detriment of, of, of others. Um, and I don't know that necessarily it's, it's a popular liberal view to have um, some sort of control over freedom of speech. Well, Omer, I, th I think it's fair to say that since the dawn of time, people have you know, they've self-censored in order for society to work better. Not everybody since the dawn of time right. has said everything that was on their mind all the time, 24-7. How, yeah. is, how is therefore political correctness any different from that past practice so that we all kind of get along, get along okay? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, I think we're conflating two things. It's one thing to self-censor out of politeness um, and just general decorum and social norms. And it's another thing to, to censor to self-censor because you're trying to suppress an inconvenient truth or an inconvenient fact that your interlocutor might not want to hear. I think political correctness is certainly the latter. Um, and that is, um, I think it negates a healthy exchange of ideas. Um, I just want to make one point based on the human rights. Look, I am a huge supporter of human rights and, and I have very deep hatred of racism. Um, with that said, there's a difference between making a hateful, xenophobic, ignorant argument and swearing at people. If you vandalize the side of a university or if you spread out pamphlets with um, anti-Semitic words on it or Islamophobic or, you know, with the N-word, of course you're going to be prosecuted for that because you're not making an argument. People make xenophobic, idiotic ar arguments all the time. I mean, do you want to ban some of the holy books? Because they're full of bigotry and racism. Do you want to ban the illiterate and idiotic autobiography of Hitler that's banned in parts of Europe? I, I hope more people read it. They, if more people read it at the time, maybe we wouldn't have gotten the disaster we would have gotten with him. That's the beauty of free speech, is that you're exposed, when you're exposed to xenophobic and hateful ideas, you, you, you um, not only can refute them, but you are able to sharpen your own arguments against them. So when you encounter someone who's neutral, you're able to persuade them and win them over. Human rights and free speech go together, and free speech, free expression, is a human right. In fact, it is the first human right, because without the freedom to express um, contrarian and dissident ideas, you can't challenge anything or anyone, especially the people with the guns and with the money. Hmm. Okay, let us return to Jonathan Chait's piece from New York Magazine from a few months ago, and I'm going to read another excerpt, and then we'll talk. At a growing number of campuses, professors now attach, quote, trigger warnings to texts that may upset students. 
and there is a campaign to eradicate microaggressions or small social slights that might cause searing trauma. These newly fashionable terms merely repackage a central tenet of the first PC movement that people should be expected to treat even faintly unpleasant ideas or behaviors as full-scale offenses. Okay, Steph, you're on. What do you think of that? Well, it's pretty rich for a, a white man to <laughs> decide what's small scale and what isn't. Uh, I think... Now, why do you go there? Well, I mean, no offense to white dudes, but there is a lot of things that you don't experience in this world. And I mean, if you're going to talk about microaggressions, this is absolutely a worthwhile use of our time to discuss these things because, I mean, all forms of oppression are connected. And, uh, you know, if you, chances are, if you're a person who makes racist jokes, at some point, you've probably made such a joke in the presence of a person who has denied housing or a job to a person of color based on the color of their skin. If you're a person who regularly patronizes or talks over the women in your office, chances are you've probably done that in the presence of some person at some point who has sexually assaulted a woman. Uh, so when you, when you commit these microaggressions uh, and uh, people like this can see and hear those things, it sends this little message to them like, look, other people also think that women and people of color are lesser. And it kind of gives them this tacit justification for their actions. Uh, so not only when you commit these things are you making an oppressed person's life a little bit more difficult and a little bit more painful, but you're also creating a context that allows these more systemic and extreme forms of oppression to occur. Akash, how much of that you want to sign on to? To be honest, I'm never sure what people mean by the term microaggression. And I, I think it's often used by people on both sides of the debate to justify um, their, their own positions. What I will say though is that if there's someone who makes a racist joke or a racist comment, the problem isn't that he's making a comment. The problem is that he's a racist and I would rather that he express that view so I know who and what I'm dealing with and I know what kind of person I'm dealing with. Freedom of expression is, is not just a right. Freedom of expression is also a weapon against those who would abuse freedom of expression. What I mean by that is by, um, by expressing themselves, by spewing forth their hatred into the public realm, whether it's in, in, in large ways or in small ways, they expose themselves. And I have enough confidence in my fellow human beings to believe that once such people expose themselves, they will be condemned. I think ultimately, one of my concerns about, uh, about attempts to regulate um, what is often described as mi microaggressions isn't that it's, it's not well intended, it's obviously well intended. It's that it tends to infantilize women, people, um, visible and ethnic minorities, and others. All of us in this discussion, every single one of us, irrespective of our gender, ethnicity, or our faith, knows that words can wound. All of us here, and, all of, and I'm sure everyone looking, watching this program, knows that words can, can wound, they can leave scars that, uh, that may fade but never entirely heal. But I think we also know that it is the fight against people like this that makes us who and what we are. We cannot have a just society unless we are prepared to engage with in injustice. We cannot have a just society unless we are prepared to defeat injustice. And we cannot defeat injustice unless we give just injustice an opportunity to expose itself for what it is. Akash, I want to do a fast follow-up with you because I think this is two or three times now that you've said on the program tonight that you have enough confidence in your fellow human beings to think that this will all out well in the end. And I know you're a guy who reads the papers every day. And I know you look around the world, and surely you are seeing the mess much of the world is in today. So I wonder where this confidence in your fellow human being comes from. Um, um, I don't think there's anyone who does not look around himself or herself and occasionally despair. And I'm <laughs> certainly one of those people. Um, but I, I, having faith in my fellow human being is the only way to live. Because if you don't have faith in your fellow human being, you can't be a liberal. Because a lack of faith in your fellow human being, that is the path to tyranny. Tyrants aren't people who want to be evil. They are people who are absolutely convinced of their own virtue and believe that they know better than the majority of society and therefore they should decide what society can do, what society can say, and where individuals fit into society. And that is a vision that I think all of us in this, this discussion reject. I think that the, the answer to hatred, to misogyny, to racism isn't less freedom of expression, it's more freedom of expression. 
It's the freedom for bigots to expose themselves. It's the, it's the freedom for good people to slay their lies with the truth. And it's the freedom of the mass of ordinary, decent people to starve them of the oxygen of public attention because they recognize nonsense when they hear it. Hmm. Okay, uh, Paulette, having said that, what's your view of these, as we go back to the quote there, these trigger warnings or these microaggressions that now seem to be increasingly present in our discourse? Well, a, a couple of things come to mind. Um, one thing is that I think, you know, a lot of people have recognized the importance and power of language. And so I think there is a, a war going on in terms of terminologies, in terms of what people choose to identify themselves as, um, and, and really fighting back around um, traditional terms or terms that people have been using to describe experiences or even to describe people and groups of people. So I think that's, that's also happening. But also, you know, I think those who have had um, the platform for so long are also feeling as if they're in a war. You know, and, and uh, having to share the space and the power of, of the, the, the of the platform and of the language and having to learn themselves that their views are not just automatically accepted and in fact being challenged. And so uh, the pushback that we're hearing in that quote is really responding to that from a white guy's perspective. But, but an important perspective that I've always had the opportunity to, to of freedom of expression. And so that freedom is now being challenged. And the answer is not about, it's not about censorship because it really isn't about censorship. It's about actually having um, greater opportunity for dialogue as opposed to um, labeling people's oppressions as microaggressions. Okay. I find that offensive. Let's do uh, one more quote here in our last few minutes. This is, uh, you guys all know Patton Oswalt, right? This is a comedian, <laughs> self-professed liberal who has been talking about these issues on uh, with Salon Magazine. Here's what he had to say. I hate to talk in terms of our side, this side, that side, but our side, the liberal progressives, the open-minded people, I don't want us to be the scolds and the shushers. That was always the role of neoconservatives and the religious fundamentalists, to restrict and remove words. I don't want our side to be the one that's parsing language. Omar, any concerns here that uh, the politically correct left is becoming the new uh, predominant shushers in our society? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think compared to the right, compared to the authoritarian right, we, PC left has a long way to go, thankfully. Um, <laughs> but oftentimes, I think that we do end up parsing little sentences. I mean, instead of responding thoughtfully to an argument or forcefully to an argument, um, we tend to pick and, and point out little words that we disagree with, which is just another way in my mind to change the subject. I mean, I'm not sure what Jonathan Chait has gone through in his life. I don't know what he's experienced, but I don't want to reduce his arguments to him being a white male, just as I hope no one would want to reduce my arguments to me being a brown-skinned male. I mean, we all have layered identities as an individual. And, and the thing is that I don't need to know what Chait has gone through because I have his arguments in front of me. What he's chosen to express, I can work with that and I can engage with that. Um, the problem as I see it is that among the PC left, you have what I call and what others have called the butt brigade. You have people who say, I believe in free speech, but, and oftentimes, the, the, the number of commas added on to that after that but have just multiplied and grown, especially after Charlie Hebdo. As soon as we get into the realm of, I believe in free speech, but you cannot criticize the state of Israel, but you cannot criticize uh, the religion of Islam, but you cannot criticize certain people and certain individuals and institutions. We're in very dangerous territory. Whatever comes after the but tends to abridge what comes before it. There, no more of this but on the left, I think. We need to see, uh, we need to say, I believe in free speech, period. Steph, you did one quite dramatic eye roll that the camera I don't think <laughs> caught when, oh, that's uh, too bad. Omar was in the, when Omar was in the middle of that answer. Do you want to come back on that? Sure, yeah. Um, well, I think that uh, what Patton Oswalt's talking about and the kinds of things that Patton Oswalt has been criticized for in the past, uh, it's often not, you know, little words that he's chosen to use. It's not people parsing his language word by word. It's people taking issue with the kinds of jokes that he's choosing to make, you know, or the kinds of jokes that he's choosing to defend. Uh, and you know, those jokes are encompassing whole arguments, not just little nitpicky words. And uh, the thing is, you know, Patton Oswalt, he may have been criticized. He still has an enormous amount of discursive power. Mm -hmm. uh, no one's taking away Patton Oswalt's platform. No one is censoring Patton Oswalt. They are simply saying, maybe you should think about the impact 
of the jokes that you're making? Are you punching up or down? And uh, I, I think it's a good thing for people to think about the impact of their words and actions. You know, it, it's these discussions that we're having with each other, they're not always about telling a person to shut up. It's just saying, listen to me. This is how what you're saying makes me feel. And I think that those kinds of conversations are really important. And I hope that people like Patton Oswalt start to do a lot more listening instead of talking. <laughs> I'm delighted that nobody has told anybody over the last hour to shut up. We've had a perfectly civilized conversation <laughs> about all of this. And I want to thank all four of you for joining us. Omar Aziz, good to have you on Skype in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Akash Maharaj on the satellite from our nation's capital. Great to see you again. Paulette Senior, YWCA Canada. And Steph Guthrie, gender and culture analyst. Appreciate all of you coming into TVO tonight for this. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.